I'm here with the legendary. Y'all watch the show, so y'all already know how I feel about this guy I'm about to introduce. Um, here with Odyssey, man. What's up? I'm good, good man. <laughs> man, how do you describe your musical style? Because I mean, I already know what you're capable of as an MC. I've been a fan of you since was it Diamond and Rough and then Mental Liberation. Them like my first two, first two projects I got dived into you. But like production-wise, like I would consider you more of like of a tribe type of inspiration. Is that is that like where you get your inspiration from? It comes from. A lot of different things. Like, uh, there's a song I, ca I came out with called Killing Time. And the first uh, couple lines in that song is grew up on that, rap a lot, grew up on that native tongue. That's, that's pretty much it. I don't know how familiar you are with the DC area as far as Maryland, Northern Virginia, DC. But most of us in that area originate from North Carolina or the Southern Virginia or deeper south. So there's this connection with Southern music, but because we're like the gateway to the to the North, there's this influence from the North at the same time. We really did grow up listening to Tribe, but also grew up listening to, you know, Ghetto Boy. Scarface is huge in D.C., huge. He's like a god in D.C. Like, there's a huge connection with Southern music in the District of Columbia, especially with Go-Go. A lot of the Go-Go tempos now mirror music that comes from the South at, at like a half tempo. To see y'all form that group and to make two incredible albums is like, oh, man. man, like how did that come about? Underground hip hop in specific and mainstream at the time, starting to get a lot more experimental with uh, synthesized sounds, like ambient sounds. A lot of uh, European influences making its way into more of like glitchy sound, atmospheric sound and rap. And I'm a fan of all of that, from Flying Lotus to Hudson Mohawk, you know, which was really jumping. And I said to myself, as an opportunist, this is a perfect time to do a throwback record because it'll stand out in the midst of everything that's being progressive. So I said, I want to make a retro record because it'll stand out right now. And I said, all right, now I know I want to do that, but what kind of, what do I want to do? Let's make a group record because people don't make group records no more. Yeah. I said, okay, group record, retro, boom, bap. How are we going to do this? It's like, all right, let's make a DC rap group that reflects the whole D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area from all angles. Where myself, I'm from Prince George's County, Maryland, which is uh, the wealthiest, uh, concentration of the wealthiest African Americans in the United States. It's a rich black suburb. It's also home to the largest gap between rich and poor economically. And Uptown XO is born and bred in D.C. My family comes from D.C. and moved out to the suburbs. YU is why we call it the DMV. Why we call it one area because he was born in D.C. like myself, went to high school with me, but then things changed and his mother moved to Virginia. And then Virginia, they moved back to D.C. Then he moved out Montgomery County for a bit, then he moved back to PG. And he's the embodiment of why we call it that, because he circulated around. We all grew up listening to a lot of rap where we knew, we knew what Decatur was, we knew what College Park was, we knew what Fifth Ward was in Houston, we knew what Port Arthur was, we knew what Crenshaw was, we knew what Queensbridge and Marcy and Flatbush. Where was that for DC? We didn't have one, so we decided let's make a record where we do that for us. And that, that was how we born. Wow. We knew each other from the open mic scene in DC. You know? There was a second track on uh, on The Good Fight, and you said, um, glorifying music that's abusive to us. That was glorifying music that's abusive and a threat to us. And a threat to us. If you got a message in your records, you collect the dust. When it comes to music, and especially with hip hop, you look at like a lot of the popular music, you look at the, the Chicago area and the stuff that they're pumping out, and I understand every city, every section want to tell its story, but it seems like we've lost kind of our way a little bit when it comes to music. So when, when that line, when I heard that line, man, that, like that's what I like about your music because, you know, you, you focus on, you know, positivity and you try to put out good message and vibes and stuff like that, which is something that I think we're sorely needed. And I think that's why people gravitate towards Kendrick Lamar so much because he's he's kind of reinstilling that in in um, in hip hop. The good fight for me was a record about an unconscious fight. Mm -hmm. Something that you just normally do habitually because it feels good to you, but you don't even realize that you're preserving or preventing or fighting for something. And that's what the term meant. All things that are worth fighting for 
in a sense, you don't even realize you're fighting for. Every song is about a different battle that's worth fighting for, whether it be between friends or loved ones or with self or, or with pro progress, all things worth fighting for and attack from different angles is basically the premise of the record. People were always telling me, you're carrying a torch and thank you for making the type of music you need, we need someone to do it. And the whole time I'm like, I wasn't consciously saying I got to fight for this. And I do a lot of interviews where people say, you know, you are a champion of this and that. I was like, well, thank you. I didn't know. I, this is just what I like to make. Right. And I guess I was like, oh, wow, I just like making this. But for other people, I'm fighting something for them. But it's just good music to me. Go fight, you know? You don't really necessarily think about being labeled a conscious rapper or anything like that, does it? Human beings need to categorize things in order to comprehend them because we fear what we don't understand. It makes it easier for us to process things. So put me in a box. Just put me in as many boxes as possible. I don't try to persuade them. I made all of it. I'm fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know? Whatever you categorize it, are you listening? Do you like it? Yeah. That's, That's all that matters at the end of the day. It's yeah. all that matters. As long as you're putting out the good music and people like it, yeah. On the production side, do you see like technology being a big influence or like I guess kind of like how you used to make music maybe you know eight years ago mm. compared to now? Like is it, do you, are you the type of person who like oh I still got to use this kind? Or are you a type that be like I want to be a wizard in everything mm. that works? Or are you a type that's like I'm comfortable in this, I do what I do in that? I'm a minimalist at heart. Mm. I don't like to have a lot of things. When it comes to music gear, whatever is in my head I want to be able to get out. The minute I can't get an idea out of my head, I look towards new technology to help me do mm. it. I've essentially used the same format for the past seven, eight years to make music. Um, I use Pro Tools to make music. And I like it because I can make music anywhere. I can sit in the van, the plane, the train, I got my laptop, my headphones on, and I just work. You know, so I was happy to get rid of a lot of my outboard gear. You know, uh, I got over, I got, I think I got maybe like 3,000 records. I left them back in Maryland when I moved to New York. I don't have no records in my house. I try to have as few things as possible. Yeah. What is that? We hold on to the past so much, it gets in the way of us experiencing the present and being conscious of the future. This idea that we, have to preserve a certain thing that may not necessarily make sense. You know, and I'm gonna get crucified for this. But there are people who say to me, man, I still use, you know, SP-1200 to make beats. It's fine, that's great, I love the SP-1200. Nothing comes close to the sound that comes out of that grittiness, that, that bit reduction from the drums and the samples. But as a person who started off with analog instruments, as a person who my first studio experiments was through Gary Scheider from Parliament Funkadelic, who had an analog studio in his basement with my neighbor and I grew up with his sons. I grew up making music trying to emulate the analog sound mm -hmm. to the point where I felt comfortable that I did it. That whole Diamond District record was done on a computer. There was no beat machine involved in it. When I let go of him, I felt liberated. I felt free to be more expressive in my music and my art because I wasn't trying to maintain. I had all kinds of invisible walls and rules. Right. Only sample a beat break from the record. If you don't own the record, you can't use that break. Suddenly that break was on CD or compilation or YouTube. And I was like, no, I can't take it from that. Why not? <laughs> I started realizing in the end of the day, the only thing that matters is if people like the music, the song. And that's when everything switched in my head when I said, why does rap music reduce itself to beats and rhymes? No other genre reduces itself to beats and rhymes. You don't go on a rock record and when you interview a rock artist, you say, you know, which one do you prefer? Making the beats or the rhymes? They just like making songs. Yeah. There's a songwriter and a producer and they get together and they make songs and people critique the song. But only in rap do we reduce our art to beats and rhymes. And I said, you know what? I'm just gonna be a hip hop artist. I wanna focus on songs. Underground rappers do not focus on songs. You don't own any records. I don't own any records, man. My homies <laughs> converted most of my stuff to MP3. Most of my library's been converted. Uh, I trade hard drives with people when I travel who's converted mm. their stuff. You're embracing wow. the digital age. A hundred percent. My whole studio is in my backpack outside. If I bring it into you right now, I've got an Apollo duet, 
for an interface. Oh, the interface, yeah, I know. I got a Bluebird microphone, mic stand, a mini keyboard for uh, for MIDI instruments. Yeah. I got a fully decked out customized MacBook Pro with as much memory. Mm. It, it's just stupid strong. It's I got Pro Tools 12. I got everything. I can literally right now go to my hotel room, write a song, record it, make a beat, record the whole thing, mix it down in my in my monitors, take my camera, my T4i and my Fuji X100, shoot a video for it, edit it in Final Cut Pro and release a video on an EP within a week. And it's in my backpack. I'm, why would I not <laughs> right, right. embrace that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good because I think as a, as a person that like to collect. So do you, yeah. do you think there's a difference difference between collecting and holding on? Holding on and collecting are two different things. If I was a vinyl collector, a DJ, someone who's passionate about, passionate about records, I would love to have a beautiful array of, of records on display. But I'm not a collective person in general. That's not to disrespect anybody who is. Right. All my, tons of my homies are collectors, and I lean on them for their collection. <laughs> you know, and I love looking through their collections. Right. Collection. But when it comes to me and going into my house, I love looking at the uh, just space and not having a lot of things, but just the bare necessities of what I need. You know, my wife would love if I was like that. <laughs> This yeah. should be considered a serious art form. Right. Because what we're doing with production, I think is genius in, in rap music. And I think that hip hop is the greatest form of American poetry and modern literature that we have that's not respected as such. Yes. You know? That too. Yeah. What we do with metaphors and similes, similes and play on words and double entendres and it's just lyrical acrobatics on a whole other level. The dexterity, the cadence, what's being done right now is not being appreciated for the art that it is. Regardless of what the subject matter is, but it doesn't get revered as that because we reduce it to beats and rhymes, you know? Do you think that's the main reason? Well, I think a lot of people focus on the negativity of rap music, so it gets overlooked. But even in the, the most negative of material, there is some form of expression that's genius. Yeah. You know, I was reading an article in the car today about a young thug debate on is he evolving language as the first rapper to communicate in a post-text language world. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very far reach. <laughs> While he's getting past the point of using clear words because he's truly being able to express emotion through tonality mm -hmm. now, is it an evolution? It's a very interesting <laughs> right. debate. It is interesting. And then I thought to myself, before I read that article, how much of James Brown did we understand? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, is that James Brown for trap music? That's interesting. Bro. I was like, Damn. And I thought about that a minute ago when I heard that. I was like, we didn't understand James Brown. We laugh at that was what I'm having to do. Yeah, yeah, right. And, love and we to it. love to <laughs> groove to it. And yet we we fucking crucified young thug. I was like, is this another continuation of black expression? But based on the way it's being presented to us, we're rejecting it. Because we had no problems with it when it came to James Brown. Exactly. But there was a level of musicality that came to James Brown that makes it right. easier to digest. Yeah. It's always been me to don't judge a book by its cover if you don't read. Like right. I can't really hate it because I have to play devil's advocate. It's just in my nature stuff. That's where I got my rap name from. Art I see, read between the lines. Mm. You know, see yes. things, see things between the two. And I, I've just been that way. It's not metal. It's not metal music without honesty. Like I oh, always thought. I, that I appreciate that. It's a, it's a great label. I, I, what I think is good about it is that the diversity of, of the label. You know, there's so many different artists that appeal to so many different demographics. It doesn't focus on spoon feeding one sound on one person or one sound to multiple groups of people. Everybody can kind of get their favorite out of Mellow Music. You got Boom Bap, you got. Yeah. I mean, you get whatever type of flavor you want. Right. You know, easily been one of my yeah. favorite groups. I mean, the, my favorite labels in the last like five, six yeah. plus years. It's, it, Mellow Music Group has mastered quantity and quality, which is a very hard thing to do. Yeah, you know? Especially in today. Yeah. <laughs> Today's yeah. hip hop, you know, it, it's, it's very tough, man. Yeah. It's like really tough. Yeah. Apple Music.
streaming service. How do you feel about streaming? Love it. You do? I love streaming. It's great. It allows people to get introduced to music without the fear of purchasing it. You know, they're, 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 they're now more willing to take risk mm -hmm. to listen to new music. Uh, whereas, you know, otherwise they wouldn't because they would have had to buy that music. So now you're getting the best of both worlds. People don't really understand. As long as your music is registered, you will make money from streaming. There's an agency called Sound Exchange that is the ASCAP of the digital world. That they, as long as your music is registered, they collect streaming revenue from YouTube, SoundCloud, anything that's streaming your music that you think you just click on it and it's free, mm -hmm. we're being paid for that as long as you register that music. Then you take a percentage, you get a percentage of subscription base on a lot of streaming sites mm -hmm. that's designated to that artist depending on how many streams they get. So you're, you're taking a percentage of the subscription base, then you're also getting paid through royalty collecting agencies or you're publishing. It's myself, I'm registered on ASCAP, SoundCloud, I have a publishing deal. I'm, I get a quarterly statement every, every uh, two, three months from my digital collecting agency straight to my phone that says, this is how much money you've made wow. from streaming and these are the songs that generated the most and it's direct deposit into my bank account and I can count on that every time from streaming revenue. Yeah. And it's collecting from every song I've ever made. Every song from my entire career that's on the internet is being is collecting from, from it. So just don't fear it. Learn about it, embrace it, and use it to your advantage. Right. On SoundExchange.com, they have a list from A to Z of artists who they owe money to. And if you sign, you can type your name in on the search engine. That's how I found out, because they owe me money. Wow. And my man was like, you know you're on this list. And I looked, I was like, oh my god, I'm on this list, they owe me money. So let me sign up for it. Almost, there, there's somewhere around a billion dollars in money that's sitting, sitting there. <laughs> that if you sign up and register, they will send you a check. But people, it's, that's how much artists haven't collected their royalties. Un uneducated. Yeah. Un uneducated about the business. <laughs> From my understanding, if you don't collect your royalties within two years of them holding it for you, they donated to charity. Wee. Any artist who got something registered on YouTube or SoundCloud or anything, go on there and check out. We need to go on there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I finally, um, <laughs> Yeah, I finally signed up for Apple Music because, you know, I like the one ecosystem of Apple. Um, and, you know, I bought, like, the bulk of your albums on Bandcamp. Yeah. I stream them on Apple yeah. Music. <laughs> so, you, you know, yeah. get that money, man. So, you know, and, and so, yeah, and, and that's what I like about it because, you know, I think, like you said, it reduces the friction of discovery. Yeah, you know, and people can actually discover and listen to you know the music. Yeah. So I mean, at the Apple Music, I just would been download records and listen to them. Same thing. Yeah, I learned. I let heard uh, the Summer '06 album from Vince Staples uh, a couple days ago because I was just looking for new rap. I'm in love with that album. Mm. That that album is crazy. He had a line He's about a, yeah, saying "nigga" to a whole crowd in France, and how does that make him feel that they repeated after him? And then he knows that they're saying all of this, but they won't even touch or go anywhere near where he's from. Right. And he said that in a line, and I was like, that that was the reason yeah. why I, I didn't use profanity in a good fight. Because I started feeling like a monkey on stage in a whole white audience saying nigga. Mm. Like, it just started fucking with me, eating away at my soul. I still cuss like a sailor, but I just won't do it on record right, no right. more. Because I can't look out into this all white crowd, and I'm like, motherfucker this and nigga that. And, yeah. and, 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 and the hip hop demographic is getting older, and we have kids. That are growing up, and I know homies that homies that want to listen to this stuff in the car with their kids, and they can't. I can't. Yeah, I do that all the time. So it was that side, and then looking, at it, I was like, cussing is actually making me lose money. <laughs> If I have clean versions, I don't need to edit them so more radio can play it. Then it's more friendly for licensing because I don't have to make uh, edited versions. Lo and behold, licensing money through the roof on a good fight. And I was like, cussing was making me lose money. Mm. I'm still, I still cuss, mm. but I'm not doing it in record no more. Like, <laughs> sure, sure this like is the it. first time I've actually talked about it in an interview. We didn't want to make it part of the marketing. 
This is not a high horse. I'm on a pedestal. I didn't cuss. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care about people cussing. It was just I wanted people to not notice. I think I was like one of the only people that noticed that Lupe didn't cuss on Food and Liquor. Yeah, yeah. It was just like that maybe one song he, he let one go and that was it. Yeah. Out the yeah, entire yeah, album. Yeah. You ever picked that up on the Lupe? I never noticed that. Food and liquor. Go back. Food and liquor. I yeah. never noticed that. All it takes is one white European to come up to you and say, What's up, my nigga? And you you'll change your tune. And they don't know better. It's Wait, not their fault. You saying that happens? It happens all the time. Man. I was about to say, I know by you like, touring and stuff. I know my, my wife is my wife is Moroccan. Okay. But born and raised in Paris. They don't understand the racial connotation of the word. Mm -hmm. So they use it as a term of just what's up, my nigga, amongst Arabs, mm -hmm. um, African immigrants to to to, to France. Well, I had to explain to my, my Arab North African wife, sweetheart, you can't use the N-word over here. It's like, why not? Are y'all saying in all of y'all songs? You know, my wife is from the hood. My wife is from the projects in France. So she didn't understand. It's like, sweetheart, you can't say that over here. And she didn't understand. And all her homies, what's up, my nigga? Like, that is crazy. And they got it from us. And they don't understand why they're not allowed to say it. They're like, well, we from the hood. <laughs> right, right. I'm a nigga too. Right, I'm a nigga too. I'm a nigga too. I'm on, I'm on welfare. I, I'm from a, 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 a project. You know, I grew up with that struggle. And I relate to this music because it tells my story. My my, my my wife's family can understand that story. And they made, I was like, I gotta take this word out because it's causing too much of a problem. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, that's that's yeah. crazy. You know, dude. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Nigga too. <laughs> I'm a nigga too. I'm a nigga too. That's gonna right. mess Think with about me. It. I, I am. I am. <laughs> there are other hoods in the world. Yep. Yeah. That's not black. Yeah. There's Russian hoods. There's yeah. Czech hoods. There's you know, gypsies, there's North African hoods, there's Arab hoods. Through hip hop culture, you're able to identify, you know, because of the struggles that you're going through over there, you're able to identify, and which is why you like hip hop culture, you're able to identify that, and you relate to the word nigga because of that, not understanding the contents or the meaning behind the word, yeah, yeah. but it still applies to you in some kind of way, you know, and you are, you are able to relate to hip hop culture and the struggle through that word. Yeah. I appreciate you. <laughs> man, Thank you. Great. That was, man, that was good. Yeah, that was very good, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, man.